and welcome to Duff Biology, Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring hazardous waste and toxicity. Hazardous waste is any discarded solid or liquid material that's toxic, flammable, corrosive, or reactive enough to explode or to release toxic fumes. The two largest classes of, of hazardous waste are organic compounds and toxic heavy metals. Some examples of some hazardous organic compounds would be pesticides like DDT, uh, polychlorinated bisphenols, or dioxins. Some toxic heavy metals would be lead, mercury, and arsenic. Now, according to the EPA, the U.S. produces 5.5 billion metric tons of hazardous waste each year. That's equal to 20 metric tons per person, or about 75% of the world's hazardous waste. Now, as a result of the production of all of this hazardous waste, it's important for us to understand its potential impacts on human health. And think of some ways that we can either remediate or store this hazardous waste so that it minimizes its impact on human health or the environment. Now, for centuries, scientists have known that just about any substance can be considered toxic in sufficient quantities. But legally, a poison is a chemical that has an LD50 of 50 milligrams per kilogram. Now, an LD50 is the dose that's going to kill 50% of a test population. So, for example, something would be super toxic if its LD50 was less than 5 milligrams of uh, per kilogram of body weight. In other words, um, taking less than seven drops of this chemical, and this would be something like nerve gas or botulism toxin. Whereas something would be considered essentially non-toxic if it took a, a whole lot, uh, about 15,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, or more than a quart uh, per dose um, to kill 50% of the population. And so that would be things like water or table sugar. Now, the effects of chemicals on individuals really depend upon a number of factors. For example, the dose. How much of the chemical are you exposed to? Some individuals are very sensitive and only need a small dose for there to be an impact, whereas other individuals in a population may need a high dose to even see an impact. How often were you exposed to the chemical? Was it a one-time acute exposure, or was it multiple exposures uh, over a long period of time, a, a chronic exposure. How old is that individual? Usually young individuals are going to have uh, a higher chance of a response. How effective are your body's detoxification systems? Are your lungs, kidneys, and livers healthy? Um, or is the function of those organs depressed as a result of disease or disorder? And then overall genetic makeup is going to impact um, the response to a particular chemical because our genes really help to dictate our sensitivity to certain chemicals. For example, let's look at the former president of the Ukraine, Viktor Yushchenko. In 2004, he was poisoned with dioxin, ingesting over 1,000 times the safe levels. Dioxins are a class of chemical contaminants that are formed during combustion processes such as waste incineration, forest fires, uh, backyard trash burning, as well as some industrial processes. Humans are primarily exposed to dioxin by eating food that's contaminated by these chemicals. The dioxin will accumulate in fatty tissues where they may persist for months or years. Now, people who have been exposed to high levels of dioxin develop chloracne a skin disease marked by severe acne-like pimples. Studies have also shown that chemical workers who are exposed to high levels of dioxin have an increased risk of cancer. Now, fortunately, Viktor Yushchenko did recover, though he does still suffer residual effects from his exposure to dioxin. But other individuals who may have received the same level of exposure could have had more grave effects resulting in their death. Now, the effect of chemicals on individuals is often illustrated by a dose-response curve. There are two general dose-response curves. The first one is called a non-threshold dose-response curve. Here, it's illustrating the fact that any dose is going to cause harm, and with increased dose, we have increased harm. 
The other dose response curve is called the threshold dose response curve, in which we don't see an effect until we reach a particular threshold, and then we began to see harm. Now, many scientists will want to apply the precautionary approach and use the non-threshold dose response curve to be on the safe side, because a lot of chemicals at low dose, we don't know what's going to be the potential impact especially since chemicals don't exist by themselves in nature and there could be other chemicals that could amplify the impacts of certain chemicals and so as a result of that synergy um, a low dose can actually have a really negative impact under certain conditions. Now much of the dose response information that we have actually comes from animal testing. Now, unfortunately, the many differences between test animals and humans make extrapolating test results to humans very difficult. So we will also seek other ways uh, to get information on toxicity levels. One place that we can get this is using case reports, um, looking at historical data on uh, negative impacts of certain chemicals on uh, humans. We typically get this from homicide reports or accidental overdoses or uh, information from uh, suicide attempts. There are two major federal laws that regulate the management and disposal of hazardous waste in the United States. The first of those laws that we'll discuss is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act or RCRA. The RCRA regulates the management of solid waste, hazardous waste, and underground storage tanks holding petroleum products or certain chemicals. The job of the RCRA is to manage uh, and regulate those chemicals from the point that they're produced to the point that they're disposed of, from cradle to grave. The second law of interest is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. This is also commonly referred to as the Superfund Program. It's designed to have polluters pay for cleaning up abandoned hazardous waste sites. The formation of this law was sparked by what's called the Love Canal disaster. The Love Canal gets its name by its cr original creator, William T. Love. William Love was interested in diverting water from the Niagara River to Lake Ontario to produce hydroelectric power for growing industries in the area. Unfortunately, as a result of the development of AC power, which allowed for the movement of electricity over long distances, and a congressional ban on the removal of water from Niagara River, his plan kind of fell through. So during the 1920s, the canal was basically used as a recreation area. In the 1940s, during World War II, the canal was actually drained, and the U.S. Army used it as a dumping ground for toxic waste. There's even some word that perhaps some of the byproducts of the Manhattan Project were placed here. In 1942, the land was bought by Hooker Chemical and lined with clay to be used as a toxic waste dump. And as a result, over 21,000 tons of toxic waste was dumped um, in this canal. In 1953, it was sold to Niagara Falls Board of Education for just one dollar. Over the ensuing years, schools and homes were built. Unfortunately, this disturbed and removed portions of the clay cap that was holding the hazardous waste in place. Over the next 30 years, uh, we saw children that were burned by chemicals seeping from the ground. Bad odors were smelled throughout the neighborhood, and there were multiple incidences of birth defects. Homeowners, led by Lois Gibbs, whose son had been exposed to chemicals, um, kind of rose up and were asking the government for help. In August of 1978, uh, President Jimmy Carter actually announced a federal health emergency and used federal funds for the first time to try to remedy the situation. Eventually, over 800 people were relocated and uh, CERCLA was passed, which had a retroactive liability component which made Hooker Chemical, which was now a subs subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum, liable for cleanup. There are many other brownfields, or these abandoned industrial and commercial sites, that may be contaminated by hazardous substances, and they would be covered by CERCLA that are, are left to be cleaned up and, if we're able to recover them, maybe even redeveloped. 
When dealing with hazardous waste, we want to have an integrated approach. Our first priority in an integrated approach to hazardous waste management would be to produce less of it. By manipulating our manufacturing process so that we produce less hazardous material, or recycling and reusing the hazardous material in our uh, manufacturing, we're going to have less of that material that we'll have to deal with in the environment. If we do produce that hazardous waste, our second priority then would be to convert it into a less hazardous form or a non-hazardous substance through uh, treatment or incineration. If we can't convert it into a less hazardous form, our final step would be to be able to put it into perpetual storage such that it would uh, sit in situ uh, unable to harm people or the environment. When it comes to converting to less hazardous forms, there are three strategies we can apply. Physical methodologies, chemical methodologies, or biological methodologies. Some physical methods for converting uh, hazardous substances into less harmful forms would be to basically filter them out using charcoal or resins to separate the harmful chemicals um, from less harmful ones. A chemical strategy would be to use a chemical reaction or high heat incineration to convert those hazardous chemicals into a less harmful form. There are two biological methods that we can use to convert hazardous substances into less hazardous forms. The first would be bioremediation. In bioremediation, we're using bacteria or enzymes to help destroy toxic and hazardous waste or to convert them into more benign substances. Another biological method would be phytoremediation. In phytoremediation, we're going to use natural or genetically engineered plants to absorb, filter, and remove those contaminants from polluted soil and water. For example, we have a biofilter in our own uh, front Monticello parking lot. It was designed to collect runoff from the upper lot to prevent oil and other harmful substances from getting into our wetland at the bottom of the hill. Now, unfortunately, some highly toxic material cannot be detoxified or destroyed, so it must be disposed of either on or underneath the Earth's surface. Without proper design and care of these disposal methods, harm can come to both human health and the environment. We can store some hazardous chemicals on the surface. One way to do that is by using surface impoundments, which are basically ponds, pits, or lagoons into which liners have been placed so that we can store these hazardous materials. You might see a lagoon on a large-scale animal operation like a pig farm, uh, where a lot of animal waste will be stored. If you visited a uh, fracking operation in which we're attempting to extract natural gas from the earth, lagoons are oftentimes produced uh, in order to store the fracking fluid. In operations that are uh, extracting petroleum products from tar sands, we also have large ponds or lagoons in which their fluid is stored. Unfortunately, if it rains, it's possible for these lagoons to overflow. Additionally, a lot of animals will mistake these ponds or lagoons as aquatic ecosystems, and will, this will lead to their untimely demise. Another way that we can store a hazardous waste on the surface is through long-term retrievable storage, in which the waste is placed into metal drums and uh, put into large warehouses where we can inspect them continuously and retrieve them if necessary. If we don't want to store our hazardous waste on the surface, there are a couple ways that we can store it underground. One method is using deep well disposal, in which the liquid hazardous waste are pumped under pressure into dry, porous rock underground far beneath our aquifers or our drinking water. If you notice, uh, we have lots of these wells in places like Texas and Louisiana. And we also have a large number in Michigan and Ohio. Um, whereas in our own state of Virginia, there are no deep wells. The final place where we talk about where we may be able to store some of our hazardous waste is in a secure landfill. Sometimes hazardous waste will be put into drums and then buried underground into carefully designed and monitored sites. 
Uh, it is lined with an impervious clay, so hopefully, um, unless there's an earthquake, um, our stuff is not going to leak out. And then it's going to have multiple caps of earth, sand, and plastic. Um, it is going to be monitored with various types of monitoring devices. And the water table, the water that we would drink, then is also going to be uh, constantly monitored to make sure that it's not leaking. With so much hazardous waste being produced, it's imperative that we find ways to reduce the production of that waste, find better ways to remediate it and turn it into less hazardous substances, and if we do have to produce it, we must find ways that we can store it to limit our impacts on human health and the environment.